And so that quickly gets us into, well, putting a sensor in the tire, and that sensor has the ability to monitor temperature, pressure, accelerations, and give us some different information as to what's happening at that contact. Tires on the moon. Are we doing that as a society, as a civilization? Are we making these things? So, you know, uh, first off, I would point back to maybe some of Goodyear's heritage. We did have some of the first tires on the moon, right, as part of some of the original Apollo missions. And in fact, there's out for uh, consideration. I don't think it's, you know, not a public knowledge is the, the return to the return to the moon missions. And I think it's like if I'm not mistaken, is it turned Artemis? Yes, they, correct. Have, right. And they, so they, there's a lot of companies out there who are forming these partnerships with Citroen. We had an announcement out there with some of the collaboration we're doing with GM and Lockheed. And of course, our contribution to that would be the idea of tires or a tire type structure, something to connect the vehicle to ground, right? That's what, that's what we specialize in. Connect, connect vehicles to ground, pass all the forces and do it efficiently, giving you traction and mobility. And um, so, so when we think of this, though, it's not a tire like you would understand normally where you're putting air in it. It's more of thinking of it almost like it's like a, uh, and, and some of these have showed up before uh, on the internet. They're almost like wire meshes. And so very advanced alloys. And they give you the ability to actually sink down into the moon dust. But yet once they get in there, they can start providing traction. So they actually see that that surface or that dust will actually be flowing through this mesh of a tire while it's, you know, moving and rolling the vehicle. And, and kind of like a mining application um, where, you know, they, they can really dictate the amount of materials they can move and how fast they can move them is really based upon the tire's durability. It's kind of the, the, the rev limiter on it. Uh, it's a similar type challenge. You know, if you want to move things around on the moon, under real, you know, these these uh, really advanced conditions, uh, a lot of this thinking is you're going to do it on the dark side of the moon. No Pink Floyd reference intended, and and you know it's a um, you know a much harsher environment uh, in terms of coldness and temperature and things. So it's a real challenge. Uh, so yes, we are working on this uh, to to enable those those next type of generation vehicles. You should tell them for product testing that you want to be one of the test people and you want to go to the moon. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm not sure if I'm going to sign up for that, but theore <laughs> theoretically I could, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I'd be a little concerned if my boss is willing to let me go do that. You know, he'd be like, oh, yeah, you should go do that. Uh, you know, do, do I need insurance policy? No, no, no. It's cool. Just go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That says he has a really strong succession plan for me. Right. <laughs> Um, have you seen that animated video that is a time lapse of the number of SpaceX launches that there have been? I have not. No. Okay. So it shows, you know, it rolls it back like 10 years and it's got the dates on the bottom as it's going. And you see one like every, you know, three months or so there's like a little blip and then a little blip. And then it looks like machine gun fire essentially with these rockets taking off. We are launching so frequently uh, as a civilization compared to anything we've ever done it's it's mind blowing it's becoming an it's almost an everyday activity it's very impressive right and yeah you know and you think about it and you know what's going to be possible and and it's it's actually starting to happen and exciting exciting you know that's it's that spirit of innovation that gives you the the the, the optimistic view of the future right and probably what made me become a cto right is get into the technology being able to solve problems so yeah, where'd you get that optimism from and that engineering side from? Do you think your parents had influence over that? Or uh, Interestingly, uh, neither were college educated. Uh, so I was first generation. Um, there was, But my dad was very mechanical. So I was always working on cars and things with him. I think as much as anything else, he wanted somebody who could still crawl underneath the car and loosen up the <laughs> oil pan and let that old oil drip down. But, but the bottom line is I think you get into that and... You like like doing it, and that's what took me into mechanical engineering uh, versus the others. Uh, but I think at the heart of it all was really the problem solving. And problem solving 
you know, to me leads to a bit of that, that optimism. Probably one connected, especially with a lot of inquisitiveness. I was, I was probably raised to be really inquisitive, but I was youngest of four. And it was a lot around, well, why is that, you know, and then just go try it, you know? And so I was always probably very experimental. Um, and, um, you know, that inquisitiveness, I think gives you the optimism and, and you made a reference. I thought it was always really impressive. Uh, when you when you hear about some of the things like a company like Tesla is doing, it was a different question, right? Which is, well, what would have to be true to be able to do that? And that I think leads to a very proactive. Well, well, geez, we would just have to do this and this. Okay, well, let's go solve that. So that is, it leads to that. That inquisitiveness leads to that. You know, wanting to to move forward, be proactive, come up with that new. And um, I think that's kind of a, you know that that. That's what really gets me excited, gets me up in the morning, right? Being in, a, uh, in the technology field. And then you growing up in that environment, did you, were you intentional about creating that for your kids? So uh, it very interesting. They all became business people. Uh, so uh, uh, one, one tried engineering and he said, boy, this is a lot of work. Uh, now, I'm not saying business people don't work, but, you know, uh, he said, I want to have more fun at college than that. And, um, but, uh, you know, they're, 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 um, they're a bit more, I would say on the social side. And so sales, you know, uh, consulting, those are the things that they've, they've gotten into. Yeah. I got, my mom was a cheerleader and my dad was an engineer. So ah. I got this like weird, <laughs> weird mix of it. So I, in hindsight, oh, I get really excited about technology. I'm like, well, that makes sense. <laughs> well, that's a great combination. I'm not sure we use it. I'm not sure there's too many stories about there about the engineer getting the cheerleader. So that's probably, uh, you're, you're out there in the tail of the distribution of statistics, right? <laughs> Thank you, dad. <laughs> well done, dad. Yes, yes. Oh, man. So you guys refer to yourself as a mobility company. That was news to me. Tell me about why you use that phrase, mobility. It really comes from um, us thinking about, again, back to, but what is the core thing we do? And at the heart of it, we connect vehicles to the ground. And, you know, we could say, well, because of that, then what we do is we're a tire manufacturer and we sell tires. And the answer is yes, very true. And we've done that very proudly for 125 years. And as of right now, there's no better way to do that. But We've done that traditionally with uh, physics, chemistry, very traditional sciences. And now when you see this immersion of the Internet of Things, we start saying, well, couldn't we do that maybe with some of those new technologies? And, and so that quickly gets us into, well, putting a sensor in the tire. And that sensor has the ability to monitor temperature, pressure, accelerations, and give us some different information as to what's happening at that contact. And now what can we do with that? And so I'll just be a couple of things we could do. One, we could help you be very, very efficient in moving things, like for fleets. Why? We could help you prevent a downtime incident because we're real-time monitoring is that tire up to the cape, up to the job to be done, right? Is it properly inflated? How much wear is left on it? We're able to do those kind of things when we combine those signals with our knowledge through algorithms. And then, of course, interacting with somebody who can take action. Or secondly, we've done demonstrations of just knowing the tire and knowing how worn it is, recovering loss stopping distance. So think of that as a safety type feature that, you know, yes, do we provide some, some enabling to braking systems today because of the type of rubbers and things we pick. But now we can do that in a whole different way by telling you digitally information about the tire. So, so. That's caused us to think about, well, those are new things then we could do or new ways we could build upon the job we've done for a long time and then connect with others to bring whole new products to market or bring them to market ourselves. Are any, I guess, retail purchasable vehicles running with the smart tires with the chips in them? So before the end of this year, our first OE fitment will be on market. So actually, for, as the original equipment manufacturer, I can't name them, uh, bring, is offering their, their vehicle. It'll have those smart tires in there. 
And oh, then nice. think of it as a new way that they can unlock new features or new driving modes or new what, what have you uh, in the vehicle. Um, you know, knowing is it a summer tire, winter tire, an all-season tire, you can oh. change the characteristics of some of these control systems. How do you keep things secrets like that? Like you have 20,000 plus people working at the company. When, you, when you're going to do that with a manufacturer, right, there has to be APIs, data, testing. Obviously, your chip's connecting to some interface and there's a whole technical system and spec. How do you keep things quiet when you're doing these types of, of deals? Or is this information not thought like that sought after so it's not heavily protected? I would say, you know, number one is, Clearly, we're creating IP, right? Mm -hmm. But but probably more importantly is we are talking about it. We're doing releases as we're doing these pilots. And so actually, if you go see, we are, we've been laying breadcrumbs out there through maybe things I'll comment on uh, through interviews like this or other interviews or the CEO will do the same. So, so we have been talking about these probably since about 2020. Um, January 2020, we had a big kind of coming out at CES where we talked about some of these new things that we're doing. Of course, COVID has kind of obviously turned a lot of things around, but but we've continued this work and continued laying out some more examples. Another one being Gaddick, who's a middle mile a delivery company. They've been doing a lot of work where I think of it as um, you've got you've got a large inventory at a distribution hub, and you want to get it out at nighttime to restock shelves, let's say at the local uh, stores in the area. And they they started out doing work with like Walmart. They do groceries up in Canada and Georgia Pacific. They do a lot of different companies, and we've been doing work with them to put these sensors in because for autonomous driving, you get this. You know, now you have a digital feedback for things that you used to do as a driver. And we've been talking about the progressive work we've been doing with them in various announcements for a while. Um, and including this past year at CES, we gave them real-time friction prediction where we could even use local uh, APIs connecting into weather. We use that weather to give you then, geez, it's an 80% chance there's snow on the road based upon snow. Here's your friction that you can expect based on the tire it is, the condition of that tire. Um, and you know, all the things that I've described. So, so it's kind of cool, you know, and now we'll start really working to hardcore, um, integrate that into the driving system, make different decisions. So, so we keep laying out nuggets out of these announcements. Um, this is also an area where to get people like Gaddick and those collaborations, because they're a startup where we use our corporate venture fund. Oh, cool. Oh, you guys have a corporate venture fund. Yeah. It's one of the key, awesome. uh, key enablers. You know, it's a strategic fund where, you know, we're investing in those folks who are driving mobility. Again, you said, why do we call ourselves a mobility company? you got to get around those thought leaders and those people who are really doing something different and then collaborating with them, right? So, so oftentimes with our investment comes some agreement around some strategic work that we can do together. When am I going to get some like maglev tires? I want some floating this apparatus with a track, I guess, underneath me. When are we going to get that? I can't. I, I Let me put it this way. Um, that's probably not getting the highest amount of my current R&D investment on the road now. So we'll say winter? <laughs> yeah, why not winter? Now yeah, that, yeah, winter. I can't know what year, but winter, sure. <laughs> It'll be winter, 2040. There we It'll go. It'll be winter. No, but when you were talking about, you know, answering my question about mobility, you spark that in my mind. It's like, yeah, you know, it, it's a tire today, but it might be something else in the future. For example, my, uh, for a closer to home example, the company that takes care of my lawn, right? They have these interesting hard tires that they're using. And I've, I've always seen those like a lot of people moved from, from that. And I figured those would just, were just good in grass, right? And those type of different terrains. That's why we don't have them on cars. Is that, is that right? So that you're referring to now to some of the concepts of non-pneumatic and, okay. and a non-pneumatic is basically, um, it's really has a, it has a big challenge. Let me just start with that. And then let's go into the applications for it. 
because we also did some experimentation with that same segment with Bad Boy Mowers. At one time, we were in market with them. And and think of it this way, that the pneumatic tire, as we know it, um, was really invented in the 1800s. And why why has it been then the structure that we continue to even build upon today is because air carries load. And, you know, go back to my mechanical engineering training, there ain't a lot of materials out there as cheap as air. And so now you've got to carry the load with a real material. And as soon as you do that, you add significant cost. Okay. And so that's the challenge with these, these architectures. Now, at the same time, I would also say, go back to your autonomous driving. Um, there's some killer apps that you could get your head around that could more than justify putting that material in. So one example would be, you know, if one of the last things holding back going to full autonomous driving is the edge case around rapid air loss in a pneumatic tire, well, come up with an architecture that could never have rapid air loss, right? Autonomy, you know, when you think of even like um, flying, right, and autopilots, there's lots of redundancy. Well, there's not redundancy in your tires. So it's a way in which to almost make them, we'll call them bulletproof. And, and so now if you're taking out an $80,000 driver on a trucking, on a truck, you'd be more than willing to pay a few hundred more dollars for that extra material in the tire, right? So, so I think it's about those, these things have a challenge to compete on the traditional attributes of the tire, tread wear, rolling resistance, traction. But it's when we move to these new mobility modes that I think you have the opportunity to use these new architectures to solve problems that aren't the problems that you're solving today. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's totally, that, that makes complete sense. So what does your day look like? You get to explore projects with this fund, you're running the technology. I mean, 20 plus thousand person company, where do you spend your time throughout the week? Yeah. So, so kind of crazy a little bit in, in my job jar is I'm not only our chief technology officer, but I'm also uh, responsible for our global operations. So that's the traditional things like manufacturing and procurement and quality, um, safety, you know, plant, plant optimization, those kind of of items as well. And you'd say, well, how the heck does that go together with this technology role? Because my technology role really breaks into the traditional tire technology, which has a huge interaction product and process, right? When you, when you, how you make and mix rubber really dictates how it's going to perform. You know, it's, it's a, it's a really interesting material to work with. So, so the traditional tire technology and your traditional manufacturing really strongly link if you really want to make step changes in how to advance those. So that's the logic of putting together. But then I have this whole area of this whole digital and new business models and things and that doesn't quite go together with operations. And, um, so, so my job jar or day is filled with kind of working between those three buckets. Very traditional things like cost to manufacture this product. You know, what are we doing to drive down manufacturing costs? What are we doing about new safety programs? And then the next meeting I'll go to might be around, hey, are we on time with this release of the, the next greatest all-terrain tire that we're coming to market with? And the meeting after that might be, let's talk about that new business model and how we're going to use that intelligent tire. So, so my day kind of really goes all over. And of course, all the just running day to day, you know, budgets, as well as all the people type, type opportunities. So, so it's a really fun day because, um, lots of variety. Yeah, that, that sounds like it keeps you busy. <laughs> you know, I'm, you know, like any leader, you got to have a great staff, right? And I've got more than a dozen folks who help really run the day to day on these things, and it's more me making making sure that things are getting in their way, right? My, I'm helping them put together kind of the a bit of the well, where do we want to go, right? You know, management really comes down to three things: make sure you got a direction, make sure you got a process to know if you're on on track towards that direction, or if you need to pivot, and then get the right people on the bus. 
right? I mean, that's it's basically those three things um, that you just constantly are cycling through, you know. Yeah, it's it's interesting when I got into the leadership space, right? Because my background, just so you know, software engineer for about seventeen years. Then I started the podcast as a hobby, so I just built software engineering teams and things like that. And then I've done north of you know seven hundred episodes talking with different CTOs, asking about leadership. And, and what I found is, you know, cause there's so many leadership books and there's so many different angles and there's so many different ways of looking at it. And I'd say after all those conversations, what I find with the successful people like you is that they've boiled it down to some very simple things that they can hit and hit repeatedly. And then they just focus on those and they might all be different, slightly different across all of them said different ways or, you know, touching similar principles. Uh, but the one thing that's true is they know what they are. <laughs> and they pay attention to them. Uh, and they all say, they all say those three things, you know, they, they track it somehow they have to have the right people, um, and direction. So I, I used to ask people all the time, well, when, when are you going to write a book? And now I'm like, you know what? They don't need to write a book. Yeah. <laughs> it's really only three things. It would be a pretty short book. <laughs> you know, I was a real business book junkie, you know, and, uh, look, super bright people have written so many of these, but they, I, I tend to start finding that they, they really kind of take and pull on one thread of a few fundamental ideas and maybe they really enhance that idea, but at the core, you know, it's those three things, you know, and you, you go back to your Andrew Grove high output management, right? Mm -hmm. There's a couple of real fundamentals that, um, then everybody's kind of built off there. Maybe some, some of the nuances and some of those things and they're helpful, but you know, with my job jar, I just pound fundamentals. You can't go wrong doing that. It's like the basic principles of, of our lives. Now, speaking of, let's go first principles. There we go. Tie it back to my next thought is, I know I mentioned Elon Musk earlier. Well, you know, you're in a big business, you're in manufacturing, you're pushing the boundaries of your industry with mobility. When you watch this Elon Musk character, I'm not sure how much you follow him, but when you watch him and you hear him talk about how he runs his factories and manufacturing and business and all of that, well, I guess the first question would be, do you pay attention to him? And if so, have you learned anything from watching him operate? Yeah, look, I, I the, first off, Tesla is a fantastic customer at Goodyear, right? So, so we'd be silly not to understand our customer and to understand your customers, understand the leadership. And so... I think it's really impressive when you see somebody come in and do things different, right? And they ask different questions. And, and so, so for sure, right. It's been very inspirational. Like I said, I, I picked up that, that item around asking, asking people a little different question of, well, you know, well, what, why won't this work? Because that gets people stuck versus, well, what would have to be true? And it gets into the same place, but that kind of came, that came from there. Right. So, so I think when we see people stretch and almost, I don't want to say break things, but they break those paradigms, um, you know, it behooves us not to go try to understand, well, how did, how did they get people to work differently, right? Or what is it that they brought to the table differently? Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we organized uh, a few of the things we do in terms of our operations and technology around something called bold goals. And that completely came from, you know, really looking at, well, well, how did other people get organizations to really step out and do something different? And it went back to, in this case, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, Elon Musk. It was actually from Procter & Gamble in their playing to win. And step one was, well, you got to have aspirations, right? And, and so sometimes as a leader, you sit there and go, well, well that's pretty obvious, but you weren't doing it before. You know, and it, it, now, once we did, we put in place these 11 bold goals that we relentlessly use as our North Stars. And then it's every year when we do our annual operating planning, it's as simple as, are we on track? What do we got to do this year that's meaningful? What do we need in order to get that done? And then we have a monthly cadence to get together and really throw the, you know, throw the facts on the table of, are we, are we on track or not? And what do we got to do about it? Each member of my staff owns one of them. And their job is to facilitate that debate discussion among all of us, because these goals go across multiple functions, right? So, so you know, I, I, 
I know you asked your question about how how inspired we are by somebody like Elon Musk, very much so. But you can find that inspiration from some others as well, right? And and then the key though is you got to do you you know do something with it. You know, it's not you can read it and say it's interesting, but until you try to apply it, you know, um, I th- I'm not sure. Um, you could comment on how effective some of those things are, but, but you know, I, I, I love seeing when somebody solves a problem different. Have you gotten to hang out with him at all? Elon? No, no, I've never gotten the honor to meet personally. Oh, you got to send him an email and be like, Hey, I just want to talk about tires for a minute. Now we get, we obviously get hands on, um, all the cool vehicles. Um, in fact, you know, we, we've, we've been doing work with Cybertruck as an example, because we are one of, uh, one of the tire suppliers for that. So really privileged, excited to do that. And, and we actually put in place in our San Angelo, Texas proving grounds. We have a huge proving grounds, a collaboration facility where we can do, you know, joint work, you know, and make sure as, as electric vehicles are coming on more and more and more to really understand, well, what are they dealing with? And, um, so we've, we've, we've had their, their team there quite a bit and doing a, a lot of work together and being able to see the, the evolutions of the vehicles. It's, it's really, really cool. Is there any tires that are specifically for electric vehicles? So yes, for sure. We've got a couple of lines of tires that are very, you know, specifically named um, in terms of um, electric vehicles. But more importantly, probably whether they're named you know, eco-friendly or EV ready or, you know, the different naming and branding and sub brands. It's, it's really around the new challenges that have come with electric vehicles. And that's with the additional weight. It's basically a corresponding challenge around providing the same amount of tread wear um, is num- number one. Now people equate that to the torque. Yes. When you first get it, you want to feel the torque and acceleration. But it's really more around just you're driving you're you're driving around with more weight. Uh, the second thing is because you don't have motor noise or engine noise, it's um, more challenges around quiet. And so we've done some innovations like putting actually strips of foam on the back side of the tread to kind of absorb some of that drum resonance that can happen. Um, and you would there's nothing else to mask that in the vehicle like there would be for mm-hmm. traditional internal combustion. Uh, the third area, of course, is the range anxiety and trying to de- still deliver that great rolling resistance, um, which is every time rubber, again, one of the neat things with rubber is as it, as you pull on it and then you release it, it does not follow the same stress or you know force displacement curve like metals do. And so that energy loss in that loop it's called hysteresis. Since this is CTO thing, we could geek out a little bit, right? Um, that's that energy loss. And so every time a tire rolls, there's actually energy road loss because of the rubber properties. And so our challenge has been a little greater on how do you deliver that tread wear, even more rolling resistance, because those two can be a trade-off and make the tire even quieter. Um, so that's mm-hmm. just today. What do we see emerging even beyond that is a lot of focus on maybe some new lightweight architectures because you've got that inertia, you know, that you've got to accelerate and decelerate. Um, so lightweight design is, got, is, is up and coming and then heavier load carrying capability from that more weight. And so all of these things form new engineering trade-offs and, you know, opportunities for some innovation. Who buys the most tires? Who buys the most tires? You mean by the certain individual? Or well, you're talking about innovation, right? And like, I, I own a small business, right? It's not, it's, it's small. And we noticed that we, were, we started to get really picky about our customers because we realized that if we take different ty- like if we focus on just this one type of customer, that's the one we really want. And then our product gets kind of shaped around that, right? And so I know you guys have, crazy resources and you can do it. But I was just curious because I was thinking about it recently at my business. I wonder who buys a lot of tires, What you know? Yeah. So, you know, there's there's various segments of the market. And I'll start out, of course, we've talked a little bit. We've named some of these great customers like Tesla or General Motors. And, and those, those original equipment manufacturers, they buy lots of tires, right? 
The great thing about them as well is they tend to be stretching a little bit some of the performance requirements for the tires because they're they're maybe meeting regulatory or you know they're the ones putting a new power plant in it like an electric vehicle right so that's a great place for us to be present not only from the selling lots of tires but also because you're on that edge of what's what's new in vehicles and being able to meet that right and so you know that's that's a big part of the business every bit the big part of that business though um is the replacement and so those tires get sold through a lot of different channels, a lot through our own company on distribution, where the recommendation is a lot of times made at that counter when the customer comes in. You know, they'll ask, so do you do a lot of highway driving? You know, do you, do you favor more wear? Do you want more traction? Do you want this? Do you want that? It will have various offerings depending on that. On the commercial side, though, might be an area, and this is really an emerging trend you can think about more and more um, with ride share is the fleet mm -hmm. and fleet customers. Now, um, we have these huge mega fleets. We do a lot of commercial truck business. I actually ran our retread business at one time. And oh, nice. um, so you see the big, big orange trucks, you know, like Schneider trucking, great customers of ours. You know, there's too many in the name. Rider, what about UPS? Um, the, you're, you're naming all the big fleets. They use oh, lots, nice. lots and lots of tires. Um, yeah. The post office, lots of tires. Uh, so, so those fleets, and and the question's going to be, you know, if if you know, we where to go? We had to come back out of COVID. This shared economy, if it you know picks back up again, it has started coming back, right? to that ride share. And if people don't have personal car ownership, you can almost think of the consumer type tires industry moving into some bigger proportion that's fleets, right? There's some of it, but predominantly it's, it's individual car ownership. Um, maybe autonomy will be the thing that'll flip it too, because the cost of a vehicle, you know, has to now incorporate that driver system as well. Um, but, but, you know, we're well positioned, whether we're selling to OEMs, whether we're selling to individuals or fleets, I would say they all buy lots of tires and, and we love them for it. So my father-in-law, he uh, has been driving for UPS, the semi trucks for 30 years. Right. And uh, he's always got interesting stuff to share. I never have anything interesting because I don't know much at all about trucking and tires. Do you have any cool, fun t trucker tire fact I can share with them at our next uh, family I, dinner? I would throw in there, say, say, well, you know, um, you know, on your current current truck you're driving today, how many of those are new tires and how many are retread? You know, because by and large, about two thirds of a big fleet's number of tires at any given time are retreaded tires. They're not brand new. So, what what do you do to retread a tire? So uh, it is a, it, it's really great because you think about it from two things. Number one, there's a very big efficiency here for the fleets. But number two is, it's a real sustainability play. But here's how you do it. You basically uh, bring in that tire after the tread has basically been worn down. And commercial truck tires are designed so they can be retreaded two, three times. Okay. So typically, you've got a brand new tire, though, on the steer position, the front of a 18 wheeler where there's only one of each when that wears down at about 150,000 miles we would take that for a big fleet like a ups we would actually take the whole rim the whole assembly and everything we then break that down at one of our retread factories we take the wheel and it goes over and it gets all cleaned repainted and you know serviced and then we take the tire to the other side. Step one is you inspect it for injuries. So make sure there's no nails in it. There's no holes in it. If so, they require repair. So we've got some inspection techniques for that. After that, you buff. You just basically think of it almost like a uh, an automated file. You go around and you remove that old rubber that touches the ribbon. You then go to the next step and you put some uncured rubber. So think of it as almost like it's going to, once you put it under heat and pressure, it'll harden up just like the rubber that you currently touch on your tire. We then pre-make a tread, a piece of tread, and it could be a ring, which is a technology we have called a unicircle that gets stretched and then put over that uncured rubber. 
You then pull of that, put it into a large chamber, you pull a vacuum and put it under heat and out comes basically a glued on new tread and it's ready to go. That is pretty cool. And so you're recovering 70 to 80% of the mass of the tire. So it's a real great sustainability play. That is awesome. All right. Well, see, now I know how retreading works and I'll be able to explain that to him. It'll yeah. be a lot of fun. If he doesn't, there you have it. You've got, you got next Thanksgiving's dinner conversation. I do. It, good thing. It'll be a little bit more friendly than the autonomous trucker situation. <laughs> yeah. You got no comment. Him. We won't go there for your friend. Don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> well, what else, Chris, do we want to get out there to the world? Was, do we have any calls to action? Go buy a Goodyear tire. Do we have anything to put out there to the world? Yeah. You know, well, thanks. First off, it's been a, kind of a fun conversation. I would say, number one, my call to action would be keep air in your tires. Uh, because, I, you know, number one, they're going to last longer, which, again, is great for the environment. Um, you might think that's crazy. Why am I telling you make your tires last longer? I can sell you more if they wear out faster just because it's the right thing, right? We look at our sustainability like many others with people profit planet. And if you really look to balance those, I want those tires to last as long as possible. Second thing is, if you keep them properly aired, that's how they've been designed to really function at their best. So some good stuff, you're going to get better fuel economy, you're going to get better tread wear, you know, uh, you'll have less durability type uh, challenges, all good stuff to help keep you safe. So that's our number, the number one message that I always give to everybody. Um, I think number two is, uh, when you're out there making choices on tires, and if you really step back, I think a lot of a lot of the times we're tempted by super low prices. And, and if you really again step back and you want to balance the best safety, your your safety, your sustainability, the long term performance that you're going to get, it's one of these where maybe it, it you know I would just ask people do do your whole homework to say you know. Um, if I pay a little more and I get a real high quality product, will it last me longer? And I think I think it's like other industries. People are challenging that with like clothing, even, you know. Don't go buy disposable clothing all the time. Buy something a little nicer, hold on to it longer. They even get it repaired, right? And it's better for the planet, it's better for all of us. And hopefully you have a better experience. And so I think when you think of good year, think of us that way. Um lastly is you know, understand we're a 125 year company and, and we're trying to transform, right? And we are going to transform into that mobility company. We're on that journey. Um, so just watch out for some of those cool new innovations, you know, like intelligence and things, um, you know, and, and to your point, somebody might say, well, geez, that, that, that never put chips in a tire. Well, you never would have put chips in your refrigerator and all these other things, either, right? <laughs> but, but it's happened. And, uh, Maybe it's like you're showing that autonomous video all the time. Um, it's it's here and it's coming, right? And so we're real excited about that and how we're going to make people even safer and hopefully do it even more efficiently. So 